This video is brought to you by NordVPN. For the last few months, much of the fighting in Ukraine has been centred around Bakhmut, a small town in Donbass with a pre-war population of about 70,000 that's since been reduced to rubble. After months of stasis and at enormous cost, however, in the last couple of months the Russian army have made a couple of strategically significant breakthroughs in the neighbouring towns of Solodar and Klitschivka. And Bakhmut is now more at risk than at any time in the recent past. So in this video we're going to look at what's happened over the last couple of weeks, whether the Ukrainians can hold on to Bakhmut and what all of this means for the wider trajectory of the war. So before we get into what's happening around Bakhmut, a quick look at what's happening elsewhere on the battlefield. There are basically two places along the front line that have seen movement in the past couple of weeks. In northern Luhansk, along what's known as the Svatove Kremina line, and southern Donetsk in the outskirts of Donetsk city, especially in Avdivka. In northern Luhansk, the Ukrainian army has made further gains, taking the small town of Novoselivsk, which lies just 15 kilometers northwest of Svatove. From here, the Ukrainian army will probably move towards the suburb of Soznovyi, which sits around Svatove and would allow the Ukrainians to fire onto all routes into the city. If the Ukrainians can achieve this, they'll be able to cut off supplies running south from Belgorod and other supply depots in western Russia down to Russian forces in places like Severodonetsk, Lysychansk and Bakhmut, which often run through Svatove and Kremina via the P-66 highway. In southern Donetsk, around Donetsk city, the Russians have struggled to make progress in either Avdivka or Marinka, which have seen heavy fighting since basically 2014. But they have made progress along a couple of tiny villages south of Avdivka, moving west from Spartak through Opinte towards Vodanya. While these tiny settlements have little strategic value in and of themselves, the plan seems to be to move north from Vodonye to encircle the Ukrainians in Avdivka, which is something the Ukrainian high command should and will be aware of. So that's what's happened elsewhere. Let's get into the most recent developments around Bakhmut. Russian forces have been trying and failing to take Bakhmut for months now, a town with a pre-war population of about 70,000 and one of the last few remaining Ukrainian holdouts in Donbass, along with Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. The town has been reduced to rubble and casualties are so high and occurring at such a high rate that the town has earned the crude nickname the Meat Grinder. Having apparently realised that they weren't going to take the town via a frontal assault, last week the Russians redirected their attention to Solodar, a tiny town about 10 kilometres north of Bakhmut with a pre-war population of about 10,000 people. While the Ukrainians staged a successful counter-offensive in the middle of the week, open source intelligence suggests that by the end of the weekend the Russians had taken the town in its entirety. Since then it looks like the Russians have moved north a bit and there are reports of ongoing fighting in Rozdolivka and Vizele. Open source intelligence suggests the Russians have also made progress south of Bakhmut around Klishchivka. It's hard to tell if the Russians actually control Klishchivka because the Ukrainians have good positions in the hills to the west of the town, which is one of the reasons the Russians have apparently lost so many men trying to take it. But on Friday morning there were reports of fighting around Ivanivska, which suggests the Russians either control Klishchivka or have decided to bypass it. Clearly the Russian plan here is to encircle Bakhmut. There are basically three routes for the Ukrainians into Bakhmut. The T0513 road, which runs south from Zversk, the M03, which runs southeast from Slovyansk, and the T0504, which runs northeast from Kramatorsk via Krostyansky Nivka. By capturing Solodar, the Russians have basically already cut off the T0513, and if they can advance southwest from Solodar to Krantsohora and Paraskorvivka, which lie just a few kilometres away from the westernmost point of Solodar, they'll be able to cut off the M03, or at least put it under significant strain. To the south of Bakhmut, if the Russians can take Ivanivska, they'll be able to cut off the T0504, which would basically leave thousands of Ukrainian soldiers trapped in Bakhmut. Now, it's important to stress this hasn't happened yet, and there's no guarantee it will. 
The Ukrainians have strong positions in all these towns, and the Russians no longer have the element of surprise. Bakhmut itself is ridiculously well fortified, with an estimated 40 brigades in the town, which might explain why Russian forces in Solodar have decided to move north towards Siversk instead. Nonetheless, it's at least true to say that the chances of an operational encirclement are higher than at any time in the recent past, and the Ukrainian high command might well be thinking about retreat to Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. While they won't want to give up Bakhmut, a retreat wouldn't be a bad option. Slovyansk and Kramatorsk are both larger and better fortified than Bakhmut, and given that it's taken the Russians months to take Bakhmut, an exhausted and depleted Russian army would be unlikely to take either town anytime soon. But it's also worth saying that while the capture of Bakhmut might have a symbolic value to the Russians, after all it's their first success in months, it's come at an enormous cost. And at this point the city is so damaged that it doesn't really have much strategic value. And it's important to remember quite how modest these advances are at the moment on both sides. These days, advances involve towns and hamlets, not cities and oblasts, and neither side advances more than a couple of kilometres a day. At the current pace, the Russians are unlikely to capture Slovyansk and Kramatorsk anytime soon, and this is bad news for the Kremlin, because capturing the entirety of Donbass, which Putin claimed as part of Russia back in September, is probably the bare minimum for the Kremlin. This is why Ukraine is crying out for more Western weapons. The current deadlock costs both sides significant amounts of personnel and material, and strategically significant advances along the front lines will require something big, like, say, Western tanks. The West has already sent armoured vehicles to Ukraine, but the big question now is whether Europe will send Leopard 2 tanks, a German-made tank that is used widely across Europe. Certain European countries, including Poland, have already expressed their intention to send these to Ukraine. But Germany has an export veto on the tanks, and Berlin has so far proved reluctant for fear of provoking Russia. History suggests Berlin will eventually give the green light, and at the time of writing, Zelensky is actually in Germany trying to convince Western allies to step up their support. While this won't make an immediate difference, escalating Western aid is bad news for Russia, because assuming Putin doesn't escalate and the Ukrainians can hold out until the new aid arrives, it could give the Ukrainians enough to break the current deadlock. But ultimately this deadlock in Donbass isn't going anywhere, and with things like this continuing into 2023, it's easy to feel like the world is an increasingly unsafe place. Fortunately, when it comes to your personal life and digital safety, NordVPN has your back. It's an unfortunate reality that online scams and phishing attacks are on the rise right now. With us getting bombarded by emails from our banks, social media accounts and even annoying newsletters we forgot we even signed up to, it's easy to click the wrong thing. One weak link can compromise security and bring things crashing down. With the protection of NordVPN though, you can use their threat protection features to identify potentially suspicious links. Even if you did reach a suspicious website, NordVPN's data encryption tools would protect against a number of other attacks like malicious man-in-the-middle breaches. Even if things do go wrong, NordVPN's dark web monitoring is always scanning for your details and passwords, and can actively notify you before you even notice. It's easy to think that it won't happen to you, or that you won't be fooled, but these scams are pretty subtle, and when we see even massive firms falling for it, it's worth protecting yourself as much as you can. So click the link in the description, or go to nordvpn.com forward slash TLDR to get a huge discount on their two-year plan, and with their 30-day money-back guarantee, you've got nothing to lose. Thanks for your support, and make sure to click the link in the description.